Hello. This is my very first podcast I've ever done. My name is Stephanie West, and about 12 years ago, my son experienced a really traumatic situation, one that ex- that affected our entire family. If you've ever had a child with a traumatic brain injury, this is definitely the book for you. Um, but this book, I just wrote the second edition, and it has some additional information on where we are all today, my whole family. Um, and, and what has happened in, and what has transpired since this traumatic event happened in our lives all those years ago. So what I'd like to do today with this podcast is read you the first chapter of this book. Um, a little bit of background. Two months before um, my son had his accident, uh, my other two daughters, my oldest and my youngest, were involved in a car accident that should have killed them. So... We call this the summer of accidents, the summer of what should have been three funerals at the end of that summer. Um, And this is where everything kind of accumulated with different things when dealing with a wayward child, per se, um, and the struggles that we went through with, with our own children during this time that was very traumatic and hard. It also this book also deals with my own anxiety and depression. I dived deep into a depression after the accident that took me a long time to recover from, and it's very open and honest about what I did during the depression and how to get over it. So let's start, and I'm hoping that I don't get too emotional. This was, like I said, it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life is to get through this with my son, and um, so I'm just going to read it. If I get emotional, I'm sorry. (laughs) I hope that you'll enjoy this. So here we go. Chapter 1, Early One Summer Morning. Around 6 a.m. on a dreary Saturday morning, I heard my husband get out of bed to wake up our 16-year-old son, Stetson, who was supposed to be at a soccer practice by 6.30 a.m. I heard my husband tell him it was now 6 a.m., but Stetson wasn't up yet. Within ten minutes, I heard Stetson start up his truck and leave. I'm not much of a morning person and was still half asleep, so I went ahead and dozed back off. As I was dozing off, I could see that it was a gloomy morning. It had been raining on and off for days, and the clouds were bad. My favorite time of the year is summer because I like bright sunshine, but this year it had rained so much, and I was so tired of the rain. I wanted so desperately to sleep late this morning, since it was the last Saturday before school started again. I just wanted to sleep in and have a lazy day around the house. As a high school English teacher, I knew that this might be my last chance to sleep in for some time. The night before, Stetson had to work until almost 11 p.m., so I knew that he was tired. He had been working on the local at the local movie theater and was in his last week of work. Scott and I never really felt comfortable with him working at the theater. The atmosphere wasn't the greatest, but it did pay pretty good. We had finally convinced Stetson that with soccer and school starting up, he just needed to quit, and he had agreed. This had been a great relief to me. As parents, it is so hard to get our children to think the way we do, especially if we see the situation as harmful to their spiritual well-being. This problem seemed as though it was an easy battle to fight since Stetson surrendered quickly if only all the battles could be won that easy. I had tried talking to him into missing that morning of soccer practice, but Stetson loved soccer so much that he really didn't want to miss any of it. He was at the stage where his team was having summer practices three times a day, which had been the schedule for the past week. I knew that he was worn out, but I also knew how much soccer meant to him, so I didn't push him too hard. Our whole lives would be completely different now if I had pushed harder the night before, or even that gloomy Saturday morning. It couldn't have been more than two minutes later that I felt this horrible blow to my chest, and then I heard a loud but comforting voice say, Get up. Stetson has been in a car accident. I was completely alone in the bedroom, but I knew who had just spoken to me. I'd heard that voice two other times in my life before this morning and knew without a doubt that it was the Holy Ghost telling me that my son was in trouble. Not only did I hear the voice, but I also felt the ter- the horrible pressure in my chest and back, almost as though I was feeling the impact of the car accident. 
With an indescribable fear, I sat straight up in bed, and within seconds the phone was ringing. Scott, my husband, came running into the bedroom and said, Stetson has just been in, our, in a car accident. I'm leaving to help and see how bad he is hurt. I remember trying to tell him that I already knew and I wanted to go with him, but he was already out the door and gone. I had been forewarned, but I did not yet know if it was to prepare me for the best or to prepare me for the worst. That, the way I felt that morning was so very different from the day I heard about Sam and Sierra's accident. I could feel immediately that this was not good, unlike the calm, peaceful feeling that filled me upon hearing about the girls' accident just two months before. When I first heard about the girls' accident through Scott's voicemail, voicemail message, I instantly knew they were fine and all would be well. It's hard to explain, but it's as if somebody had put an arm around me and whispered in my ear that everything was fine. Call it mother's sixth sense or a mother's intuition. But I gradually knew, after hearing the Holy Ghost warning, that Stetson's accident was different, that it was awful in every sense of the word. I rushed to the bathroom and started getting ready when I heard the sirens. We live in a very small community, and the fire department is all volunteers. The station was down the road from us, so I watched as they flew past my home. I was able to follow their path up Pinedale Road and then stop at the highway to turn right and start towards Shalom. They had two trucks out that morning, and I instantly knew that it was more than a little accident. The only time they ever took two trucks out was for major accidents or even fatalities. I then started towards the door and realized that I didn't have my shoes on. So I turned and ran back to my room to find some. Finally, I grabbed my keys and rushed to my car. There was no way I was going to sit and wait. It just wasn't in me. As I started the car, I was in such a daze that I could not feel anything. It was as if I was floating, and there was very little sound around me. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we are taught that when a traumatic situation happens, such as the loss of a loved one or a child, the Holy Ghost will comfort you through the pain, even going as far as to carry you for a while until you are ready to deal with the event itself. At this point, I was really not aware of much around me. I just knew that I had to get to the accident site, and I wasn't considering what I might see or the effect that it may have on me. It wasn't until much later that I learned I was already experiencing the first stage of grief, which is a shock, at that particular moment. Feeling dazed and wondering where I was and what I was doing was how shock affected both my mind and body. Shock is the beginning of an incomprehensible journey that at times just seems to be too much to handle or even understand. I found that this stage lasted long enough for me to get my bearings straight and get my head wrapped around the situation. I believed the Holy Ghost was with me and carried me through this stage, and that is why I didn't feel all the pain that I could have. It wasn't until I pulled to the accident scene that I started to question what I was doing and what I was about to see. There was a line of cars stopped on the road, but I went around them, upsetting several of the drivers. As I pulled off the road, I could see Stetson's truck, and I started to worry that I was about to be told my son had been killed. The look of the truck scared me to death. The windows were completely gone, and the roof of the cab, cab was smashed in completely. The hood of the truck had been pulled completely off. It was as if it was simply been peeled away, almost like when you peel a banana and it was hanging off on the passenger side. It was the strangest and scariest thing I had ever seen. As soon as I had overcome the horror of what I was seeing, I got out of my car and headed towards my son. At this point, he was lying on the ground where my husband was holding his head very still. As soon as I started walking toward the two, Stanton Davis, a young man from our ward, stopped me and tried to hold me back. Sister West, he said, Stetson is alive but he's in a lot of pain. Brother West said to keep you back until he says it's okay to go to him. He was starting to look desperate, and I could see that he was trying to follow the orders given to him by my husband. At first, I just looked at him in amazement because he was trying to stop me from going to Stetson. I tried to push my way through, but this young man kept holding me back, which was really starting to irritate me and more than anything scare me. Stant was a tall young man with dark curly hair and a presence about him that one noticed. 
He was a great example of a good priesthood holder, and he was well liked throughout the ward and at school. He was only 17 year old, 17 years old, and I was surprised that he was trying to hold me back with such persistence. I could not believe that he was telling me that I could not go and see my son when I desperately needed to see how he was doing. How he was doing. Please, Sister West, he pleaded, don't go over there right now. I'm going to see Stetson right now, I said, a little stronger than I should have. Please, Sister West, begged Stanton. Brother West will let you know when it's okay to be with Stetson. The look in this young man's face started to really scare me. Stanton had come into his own about a year earlier when he had played the role of Gaston in the high school musical Beauty and the Beast. Before that, he was quieter and unsure of himself, but that side of him hadn't been seen in recent months. I looked over towards Scott, and he shook his head not to come forward. People asked me later on if that upset me, but I could tell at that moment he was doing everything possible to make sure Stetson was comfortable. He is also the one person in the world who could read me as clear as day, and he knew that if I did go directly to Stetson that I would lose control which is not what Stetson needed at that point. It wasn't until later that day I, I realized I was probably too stern with Stanton. I just wanted to see and hear my son. Stanton had been given strict instructions from Scott to hold me back. There was another young man at the site. His name was Dallin, and both Stanton and Dallin had been Stetson's young, Scott's young scouts when they were deacons. These boys had spent many weekends with Scott on campouts and participated in many activities with him. They knew when he was serious and had good enough relationship with Scott to follow his instructions. I started to panic, and even though I knew that Scott wanted me to stand back for my own sake, I couldn't help the questions racing through my head. Why couldn't I go and be with my son? I needed to see for myself if he was okay. My chest started to contract, and I started louder than I should have, asking the people around me what had happened. Even though I had asked the questions, I couldn't stop asking long enough to listen. Stanton took my arm gently and said, Sister West, please come sit down. It was then that Stanton took me over to his truck to calm down. He kept trying to reassure me that Stetson was breathing and talking, but he could tell that I needed to sit down before I completely lost it. Stanton told me that he had, they had arrived within seconds after the accident happened. He and Dallin had been running late also, just as Stetson had been, and figured they got there soon after Stetson had been thrown from the truck. You need to go ahead and go to practice, I told them both, even though I'm still not sure why I said that. I'm not leaving until I know he, he is okay, and practice really is not more important than Stetson. Besides that, I really don't feel like playing soccer now, and when this is over, I'm going to go home. See my mom, Stanton replied. This 17-year-old boy took a lot upon his shoulders that day, and he took very good care of me. He could sense that I was a wreck and stayed with me until I could move on my own. This is something that I will be ever, forever grateful for and will remember always. To this day, Stanton holds a very special place in my heart. As I was talking all of taking all of this in, I noticed Dallin standing there with his parents, looking shocked and really shook up. This was a lot for these two young men to take in and understand. Scott later told me that he was disappointed that the two boys did not do more, especially since he had taught them first aid skills. I defended the boys by saying that a traumatic event like this is especially hard on young teenagers. It had been hard on them as they watched a good friend struggle and hurt. They were probably in shock themselves and weren't exactly sure how to handle the situation they found themselves in. They don't have the life experiences to even know how to deal with something like this. If I was having a hard time with what had happened, I could only imagine how hard they were taking it. Dallin was another young special man from our ward who I felt is a good priesthood holder. Dallin is always putting himself others before himself, and he just had about the biggest heart that I'd ever seen. When we first moved to Pinedale, Dallin was a skinny little boy with curly blonde hair. In the past year or so, he had risen to the height of six foot, six foot five, and he has the heart to match. He and his parents were trying to calm me down by letting me know everything they, had knew, they knew about the accident. 
As the boys, two boys came upon the accident, they immediately recognized Stetson's truck, ran up to him, and tried to make him as comfortable as possible. Dallin had even taken off his sweatshirt and put it under Stetson's head. Dallin then called his dad, who in turn called Scott and told him what had happened. It was such a comfort for me to know that Stetson was not alone for very long after the accident. My son being alone and terrified was something I could not have dealt with. But knowing the two friends and fellow priests arrived so quickly gave me a great deal of comfort. Right after Dallin had called his dad, an older gentleman had stopped by to help. He asked the two boys if he could give Stetson a priest of blessing, and the boys said yes immediately. The gentleman laid his hands on Stetson's head and gave him a priest of blessing as the two boys held Stetson's hands. As soon as the man was done with the blessing, he told the two he had to leave, got in his car, and drove away. He was gone. I asked the boys if they knew who he was and where he lived. Stanton says that he thought he lived in, in Clay Springs, but he wasn't sure. Dallin said he never met the man before. But Stanton said he seemed familiar to him for some reason. I was having a hard time understanding why this man would stop long enough to give Stetson a blessing and then leave before proper help had arrived. I had the impression that he was not of this world. It was as if he had been sent there by angels to give Stetson the priest a blessing that he so desperately needed. And then he was gone. To, to this day, none of us still know who that man was. Scott arrived on the scene and knew enough from his former police days that he needed to hold Stetson's neck in a C-spine hold until help arrived. When the fire department got there, they recognized Stetson and Scott immediately and quickly went to work. In our small community, everyone knew everyone. One of the firemen there was Stetson's former teacher's quorum advisor, Champ Garvin. Champ is this big, tall, broad man in his early 30s. This man has spent hours with his teachers and loved these boys with all of his heart. He had recently moved to Phoenix, but he had been home visiting that weekend. When the call came in at his parents' home, he went with his dad to help. Little did he know that we, that he would be that he would come upon one of his teachers lying there on the road. As he came upon the scene and saw Stetson, he panicked and drops to his knees next to him. Scott later told me that when Champ first came running up, he leaned into Stetson and told Stetson that he was there and he would not leave his side. And he was going to do everything he could to help him. Champ urged Stetson again and again to not give up, to hang in there and everything he had in him. When Champ leaned down and started to talk to Stetson, Stetson started to respond. Champ had tears in his eyes and had to refocus on helping his fellow firemen give Stetson whatever medical attention he needed at that time. <laughs> Having people on the accident scene who loved and cared about Stetson and our family was a great comfort to us. If we had lived anywhere else, we probably would not have had this comfort. Those men knew Stetson and our family personally and took every precaution in helping him with more than just physical injuries. I knew that Stetson could feel better I knew that Stetson could feel that he was in good hands with these men. There was another man at the accident site who was trying to let me know what he felt had happened. He kept going on and on about how many times the truck had turned when exactly, and when exactly it looked as though Stetson had been thrown from the truck. He was telling me things that were too much for me to take in. So I asked him to stop and just tell me the simplest details as possible. The rest was too much for me to handle. He then explained as much as what he knew in as little graphic detail as possible. At first, no one knew how the accident happened, but we soon found out the cause. Sesson had come around the curve in the road, and an elk had run out in front of him. He swerved to miss the elk, ending up on the other side of the road, and then overcorrected. It had been such a wet spring and summer that the elk was big and abundant. 
We lived outside of the town limits where elk and deer roamed free, especially out in our small community of Pinedale. That morning was dreary and wet as he rounded that first corner on Highway 260 and was faced with an elk in the road. As he swerved to miss the bees, he hit the soft mud on the opposite side, which sent the truck rolling with our son inside. As the windows broke out with each roll, Stetson was ejected out the front window and landed on the road. We informed that only 25% of victims ejected from a car survived. The stricken look on everyone's face made it clear to me that everyone knew this was extremely serious. I could hear Stetson cry out in pain as they tested the different parts of his body. I could see the worried look in my husband's face and knew that Stetson's condition was bad. Scott was trying so hard to hold it all together as he held on to Stetson's head. I was so desperately wanting to put my arms around the two of them. These were the two men in my life, and my heart ached for both of them. Even though my head told me to stay away, my heart told me that I had to get closer to my son. So I got out of the car and moved as close as I could without disturbing what the firemen were trying to accomplish. As I was standing there listening to what was going on, I looked down at my feet and noticed Stetson's red scripture pencil lying on the ground. Suddenly it seemed as though everything was muted as I bent down and picked up this pencil. I could see my son as a small boy playing ball in the backyard, smiling a smile that lit up his tiny face as he showed me that he could first how fast he could throw that ball. I then saw him as a small kindergarten going to class on the first day, and again I saw that sweet little smile. He wasn't too sure that he wanted to go to kindergarten that first day, but I knew he had to be but I knew he had put on a brave face and went anyway. I could see him that day the day he was baptized in his little suit and tie. How proud he was to become a full member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. He was so excited about the set of scriptures that we had given him with his name printed on them. I watched him as he flipped through the pages and ran his hands over the words. He loved scripture reading and would be the first at the table with his scriptures ready to go. Always smiling, that beautiful smile. I then saw him as a deacon passing the sacrament for the very first time. He was so eager and excited that he could not stop smiling. After the sacrament was complete, the bishop stood at the pulpit and told the audience how exciting it was to see a young deacon so thrilled about doing his priesthood duties. All these memories came flooding back as I looked at the scripture pencil, not knowing if the memories were all I was going to have left of my one and only son. I did remember the past several weeks as Stetson started to struggle. I then remember the past several years as Stetson has started to struggle with different things in his life. One is, is his testimony in the gospel. He started to question everything in his life and what he really wanted out of life. At this point, he still not come to a decision about whether or not he was going to continue on as a member of the church. This had hit me hard a few weeks earlier, and now it came rushing back as I stood there on the road that morning. I started to wonder if he was going to be given the chance to answer those questions, or if he was going to leave this earthly life with questions on where he stood. The noise of the scene around me started coming back as I heard somebody calling my name. They were telling me that a helicopter was on its way and would be transferring my son to Scottsdale Ors 1 Hospital. At this time, I was still in shock, and I just nodded my head. I noticed the ambulance had finally arrived, and the paramedics were strapping Stetson down to a back board. It was at this point I was finally able to go and see my son. Scott was still holding Stetson's head and talking to him. But I could see that despite Scott's efforts to comfort him, Stetson was still in a lot of pain. He kept saying that his legs hurt, and each time they touched his leg, he would scream out in pain. His right eye was swollen and black, along with so many scrapes all over his body. They had wrapped up his left arm, which had severe road rash, as well as his right ankle, which was bleeding profusely. Scott had some of Stetson's blood on his cheek. 
which caused the fear to rise again. Scott then turned to me, glanced at my feet, and then gave me a straight look, strange look. What shoes do you have on? <laughs> it was such an outlandish question that I looked down at my feet and saw that I had on my good sandals with tennis soles. What does it matter what's on my feet? Sorry, he said. I don't know why I asked that. It was as if he needed a break from what was going on around him, and he ended up focusing on my feet. He then gazed at me with a look that I will never forget and hope to never, ever in my life see again. He looked at me as though to say that I needed to tell my son goodbye, or I might not have the chance later. This look sent, sent chills down my spine. I wasn't ready for my son to die and leave this world. I was trying so hard to hold it together as I leaned down over Stetson. All I could see was my little boy lying on the ground, and it brought tears to my eyes. Scott told me to talk to him and try, and try to stay calm, which I did. Stetson, I said, I'm here. I love you, and everything is going to be okay. Stetson, can you look at me? He looked up at me as a tear formed and fell down the side of his face. It's okay. I am here, and we are going to send you to the hospital so they can know exactly what's wrong. He then nodded at me and kept looking into my eyes which filled with tears right along with his. I just kept telling Stetson over and over that I was there and that I loved him very much. I could not bring myself to tell him goodbye. I just wasn't willing to tell him those words. He just kept watching me, but he didn't say anything. The paramedics then asked me to step back so they could get him on the gurney as we heard the helicopter coming. I tried to keep a hold of Stetson's hand. But Scott had me let go and stand back. It was as though my son had been ripped for away from me. I immediately felt this overwhelming sense of loss as I stood back and watched. I needed to be able to touch him just to reassure myself that he was still here with me. That nobody would let me get him close enough again to do that. The world around me seemed surreal. And it was as, as if I wasn't really there. I knew I was, but it was as though I was watching the entire scene unravel, and I was on the outside, looking in. There were times when it felt as though I was watching a movie, but no movie had ever affected me as strongly as this. As the paramedics came forward to prepare Stetson to be taken by the helicopter, something pushed me forward. I am going with him, I said to the paramedics. I was determined to just stay with him the whole time. That is not possible, the paramedics said. There is only room for the pilot, two nurses, and your son. You will have to drive to Scottsdale. I was so mad that I could not go with him, but I didn't do anything. I just stood there fuming, not knowing what to do with all this anger. I could not figure out why this was happening to my son. Even though I was angry, I was also starting to feel very desperate. I had this need to just touch Stetson one more time and make sure this whole thing was real. But still, nobody would let me get close enough to him. As the helicopter prepared to land, everyone seemed to be moving very quickly. They probably were not moving any faster than they had been before, but to me, it seemed as though everyone was in high gear. Again, I felt as though I was on the outside looking in. The helicopter landed right there on the road. I remember just standing there in the middle of the road, all by myself, not sure what to do. Then they loaded Stetson into the helicopter, and I still had not been able to touch him one last time. It seemed as though it took an hour to take off, as I just stood there, not knowing what to do. I could see Scott still helping with Stetson and Stanton and Dallin just standing there, not knowing what to do, just like me. 
Other people were working, but the whole time seemed to stand still, and everyone was holding their breath, waiting for the helicopter to leave. It was a strange sensation watching my child leave without me. Well, all I wanted to do with all my heart was to be with him. So I stood there, frozen in one spot, not able to move forward and backward, just still. As the helicopter took off for Scottsdale, I prayed to my Heavenly Father that no matter what happened, he would let me see Stetson one more time and tell him goodbye if it was truly his time to go. <clears throat> so, if you want to finish my book and find out what happens to Stetson and our family on this journey, please do. On the last slide and on the beginning slide of this video is the uh, the link through Amazon that you can buy it for. So again, thank you for joining me for my very first podcast. And I really hope you buy my book and enjoy it as much as you can and learn from it. Learn about depression, anxiety, what traumatic situations and some loss different kinds of loss will build your family to be stronger than they are today. Again, thank you, and I will see you soon.